So we are check check. We are recording. And we are live. We are live. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's episode from Australia, I have Greg Whitney introducing him from Slaughterman to Compassionate Warrior. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you. And let's just dive right in into the the nitty gritty. Sure, man. I was just I was just um, listening when when you were about to pop up. I was listening to this song of Snoop Dogg, where they have this this kid interviewing, like, "Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up?" Remember this? And then this kid, will, "I want to be a motherfucking hustler." Um, when you were at school, were you were you planning to to become a slaughterman? No, mate. Um, all through my school, my early years in my school, I wanted to be like my father, a farmer, because that's how my dad programmed me to follow him around and learn the tricks and the trade the trade of the land like he learned from granddad. And I was a fourth, became a fourth generation farmer. And as I grew older, that I sort of lost interest. I sort of realised the hardships of growing up on the land, and I lost interest. And I wanted to get into the military of all of all things, the navy. That's where I wanted to go, but because I failed my, my high school, I ended up working in abattoirs or slaughterhouse. Mm. Yeah, so there was no slaughterhouse. On you didn't slaughter the, the the animals on your farm. No, Dad always sent them in to be killed. Sent them into the meatworks. So. Okay, and and then where where was the slaughterhouse? Was it? How old were um, you then? Yeah. I was only, I was young, a young fellow, so oh, under 10 year old uh, before I left the farm. Dad always would put the, put the cows on the truck and send them in uh, to be slaughtered. Uh, they go into a, a country town to a meatworks for about 100 kilometers, get slaughtered and dressed and brought back to the farm. And then what did you do with it? Sell it? We eat it. Oh, you, you would eat it? And, and self consumption, yeah, yeah, cool. And then, what, what, what was the story? Do you remember how you how you felt when they went for slaughter? What, what? I didn't know at the time. Dad always told me that the meat, well, early in my early years, the meat always came out of the freezer. He never told me how it, the process actually happened uh, until I worked it out for myself in my later years. Yeah. So when did you decide to to work at a slaughterhouse? I was 19 years of age. I just I was not long out of home. I was jobless. I was in a country town. I was going nowhere. I was on taking welfare benefits. I was getting depressed. Uh, all my schoolmates had moved out of home and they had left left the town I was in. I was come from Casino, Northern New South Wales. So country town, population of under 10,000. Not much, not much opportunity to progress, unlike the city. Um, my two schoolmates at the time, they moved to a country town called Inverell out west in New South Wales and got a job straight on at a slaughterhouse out there. And then because I wasn't doing anything, I kept in contact with them. And then they, they kind of encouraged me to move out with them and get a full-time job, industry of screaming, and be able to make a break for myself. Was it paying well? It was a good, decent full-time wage, better than what welfare was paying. Yeah, yeah. So you knew some guys. It was more than the welfare, and you were yeah. you were like coming from a farm. So you, what were you thinking? Were you were you thinking anything like, hey, man, I'm I'm about well, to kill desperate. animals, I or I was desperate for a job. You would do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I had yeah. No money. I was broke. I was bust. I was depressed. Opportunities yeah, are rare out in the bush, mate. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then you you have your first working day. Did you have an interview or anything? Yeah, we did do a uh, pre-qualification sort of interview, just meet the bosses, just connect, see if I'm suitable in that sort of role. I went to the doctors, I had the medical, physical, did all my drug testing, I passed all that and then it was pretty much straight in on my first day. And and how how do they check whether you're eligible for the job like 
Well, there's a number of factors. I mean, you go through your physical tests, so a chiropractor or a physio would go over you and test your body and flex you out. In other words, see how flexible you are for manual labour. People fail there or they'll go in for their induction. So you'll go in and see how the plant operates for a day. Uh, in other words, get your whites on and go for a walk through the kill floor and through the boning room and so forth to see how the place sort of operates. And if that turns your stomach, well, then they'll send you on your way. And yeah. if you do make it through all those processes, well, you got a job. Yeah. And then did you have a, like a, a spot or do you move around the, the kill floor? Do you do uh, something well, in specific? Did, did you apply like for a function? I applied for a uh, unskilled labor position. So an entry level labor. So that covers a broad range of unskilled jobs, you know, from kill, the kill floor right through the boning room and associated areas. Fortunately, I started on the kill floor because that's where a position was that was need, needed urgently filling. And why is it fortunate? Well, because it was a space that, urgent, that urgently needed filling and I happened to physically meet the need of that, for that job. Yeah, yeah. All right. So... You were saying 19 years of age, roughly? 19, mate, yeah. Yeah, 19. Uh, how, how old are you now, if I may ask? I'm 34. 34. So, 19 years of age, you pass the test, and you've got a job, and then you go there for your first day. And how, how, how does that look? You... I, felt, I remember I felt, I initially felt, you know, I felt queasy about the whole uh, being on the inside of an abattoir, but I knew that growing up on a farm, that it was the process. Um, we killed to eat meat. It's just we killed it in a contained environment and processed it to become the product at the end of the chain for consumers. Um, it did, I did did take me a little while to adjust. My first day was very, I could say, traumatic to the head. I did get covered in a lot of blood because uh, I started as an entry level labourer. I was a what they call a floor boy. So I was pushing blood on the kill floor from the knocking box, which is basically where the, where the cows get knocked or stuck and hung. So I was pushing blood from the knocking box to the bleed rail to keep that area clean, backwards and forwards. That was my very first job on, on, in a, on the kill floor. Yeah. It was quite interesting because I was seeing fresh animals come through from the knocking box that were freshly killed right through to where they were electrocuted and then the process started the pre-trimming and dehiding. Yeah, so, cow, so it was mainly cows or only cows? Yeah, I'm only experienced in cows on, on the commercial slaughtering. Cows, yeah. Oh man, I feel you. I just uh, bear witness to uh, cows getting their throat sliced uh, last weekend. Um, so, can we talk like num uh, how how big is this place? Well, it's it's fair size slaughterhouse out western New South Wales. It well, last time I knew, it knocked about nine hundred head per eight hour shift, and that's two shifts a day, so they have a day and an afternoon shift. So it's 900, so it's 1800 between two shifts. That's that's a fair volume for a medium sized slaughterhouse. Yeah, 1800 cows a day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right, and then you, you were there for a couple of weeks. Um, I, did, I did a couple of years at in yeah, yeah. yeah but but let's let's take i want to yeah. take it um uh easy on 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 your 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 growth or your career if i may say in in yeah. so then what was what was next you were you were a floor floor boy i was a yeah. floor boy for a good 12 months okay that was my initial then they offered me a certificate um like a traineeship the start of a traineeship and i did that i did my entry level so basically was a floor boy for a year and then I got signed off from that. Then I started the next, my next level cert three, which was starting to get into the knife hand roles. That's when I got ch changed my roles and got put, got put up on a knife hand roll to get used to the knife. 
get the feel of a knife, like a pre-trimming roll or, or on the kill floor, like a paunch table, um, gut floor, for instance, is a knife, any, any knife hand roll. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere where you're using a knife, but not doing an A, what they call an A grade job or a B grade job, you kind of C level. Mm -hmm. And and how long were you were you doing the the knife uh, jobs for? Twelve months at that slaughterhouse, and then I yeah. moved to a different one in Queensland, and then continued on. Yeah, so you went to another slaughterhouse. Mm. Where I finished my trade at a at a second slaughterhouse. Yeah, yeah, and 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 what what were you doing there? It was cows as well. Yeah, cows. So I was one up here in Queensland, the largest slaughterhouse in the southern hemisphere. At the time I was working there, it was knocking anywhere between fourteen hundred to eighteen hundred per ten hour shift. Mm -hmm. They ran two shifts a day plus a weekend shift at the time, so the plant was going seven days a week virtually. Yeah, yeah. And well, man, um, and 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 yeah, how were you? How, did you move houses as well? Like, were you still? I, I mean, you I moved to Queensland. Yeah, I moved to a different state. Yeah, I got trouble went down in Inverell. I was literally told to leave town. You know, being young, wild, drunken, I was addicted to substances such as drugs and alcohol. Uh, I literally, yeah, I got myself into too much trouble. Yeah, yeah. And I had to leave town. So I followed the meat industry trail up to Queensland. Hmm. And got a job on at another slaughterhouse and then finished my slaughterman trade. Do you think you were were you already um drinking and drugging um before you um you worked at a slaughterhouse? I, start, I started the substances when I was in the meat industry. Yeah. As a so stress relief. As a stress relief, why? why? Yeah. I mean, well, mentally, I didn't like the job. Physically, I didn't like the job. It's just the whole toxic environment started getting to me um, after 12 months. So I didn't what what is toxic there. about it? Well, the toxicity of the workplace, the negative attitude of the workplace, plus looking at blood and death all day long, it starts to have an effect up here unless you suppress it. What kind of effect? Uh, nightmares, depression, um, yeah, just keep yourself sane. You start losing, you start losing it because of the work so repetitious. So repetition, repetition, and you're doing the same thing day out, day in, day out. Yeah, you know, laboring is mind numbing. Mm. Intense, brother. And and then what? So how? How did your day look? You had shift work, or did you always yeah, had morning I shifts? On, I was on day shift, fortunately. Yeah, um, and then you would come home and 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 start uh, abusing substances until you. Yeah, I was an or? alcoholic, mate. I drank, I drank day in, day out. I'd go to work drunk. I was a heavy pot smoker. I was into the narcotics. Um, I'd go to work blind, mate. So. Um, this next abattoir was a little bit wilder. I mean, they'd use drugs on site during during the breaks, like smoke weed and you know, shoot up um, on their on their breaks to keep themselves alert. Um, so you weren't the only one doing that. No, no, mate. Eighty percent of workers are all addicts of some of some form, mm -hmm. whether it be nicotine or, or illicit drugs. Yeah, and then and then, what what was next? You well, I finished my slaughterman trade at uh, Dinmore, which is the largest slaughterhouse in the Southern Hemisphere. I did a couple of years there, then I quit, and then I went to another slaughterhouse over on the eastern side of Brisbane, and then got a job there, and then continued my trade on as a slaughterman, and then I progressed up. I got. I, sh I, sh I sh was uh, I showed good potential as a leader, and I was chosen as a protege to become a protege workplace trainer. So my whole career spanned over seven years. So from start entry level to the time I quit as a protege trainer. Yeah, yeah. I was an active 
tournament for about five years. Okay, so... so I, finished, I finished my career off as a protege trainer where I travelled all over Australia and uh, and assisted. I followed this old fellow around because I was going to take his job, assisted in setting up small, small slaughterhouses and looked at different systems, learned how to set up systems. I did a bit of travel to you know, places like South Africa, Malaysia and Osaka in Japan to see how all those systems worked. I've seen the traditional halal slaughter firsthand, no stun. That was in Malaysia. Uh, I've been to the Kimberleys up in Western Australia and across the Northern Territory in the small Aboriginal community setting up small kill floors for water buffaloes uh, using 44 Magnum pistol as the skulls are too thick to penetrate with a standard bolt. Um, yeah, mate, that's where I ended my career on as a protege trainer. Yeah, yeah, I I do have a few questions on, on on that and what you have seen around the globe and and whether or not there there yeah. there is differences. I just want to take you back to um, <clears throat> to your uh, career where you um, then um, like became or you were classified to do an A grade job. Um, so yeah. that means slaughtering an animal. Yeah, basically I, I was qualified so. I qualified myself in the three components of a knocking box. So that was one that was shooting. So using the captive bolt and stunning the cattle between the eyes. Uh, step two in the sequence was sticking. So cutting the throats. And step three was shackling, which is basically putting a chain around the rear hock of the animal or the cow and then pressing the button and let, letting the chain hang them up. So I, qualify, I got qualified on all three components, which then gave me the qualification of a slaughterman that I needed. Mm. And then and I progressed, I did first leg and second leg, which are two other A-grade jobs of mm. the slaughtering processes. Mm. Yeah, man. Um, as a floor boy, you saw the cows coming in and you saw the the whole procedure and now you're a few years in and um what you had a, a bolt gun in your hands or uh, like yeah, do you do you re a, recall knockers, okay. knockers used a, the bolt gun that we used was a commercial one it wasn't these little small ones that you see over in the united states of amusing so it was a massive air compressed two-hand job it was designed to push through good, you know, high volume numbers of cows. So you, you could stun a beast within one second or half a second, drop it there, the beast would drop down on the, on the, to, to, to the, into the cradle, slaughter or the sticker would do his job and it'll be uh, shackled and moved along. So you could, you could do a beast every three to five seconds, basically. Is this cow stun. dead then? It's by procedure, yes. What does that mean? Well, by protocol, if it's stunned between the eyes, it drops and the sticker cuts the throat from left to right and cuts the, the esophagus or the throat. Uh, the, successfully, then the cow is classified as dead. Yeah, yeah. So successfully, where there are also occasions where the you, you, someone missed or... or... Oh, mate, because of the high volume that went through, misses and fails. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very common statistic. Uh, at least 20% to 50% uh, are, are either stunned partially wrong or completely wrong in out of procedure. Uh, there's, there's heaps of room for error. Mm. But then the error, and the error is even higher if training younger workers to do the job because they're still learning. Yeah, man, um, breaks my heart. Um, especially, uh, yeah. It takes a lot to get used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that is, I mean, we're gonna talk about men's work and, and, and stuff uh, later on, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'll, okay, I don't wanna fill in the blanks, but was, it, was, was there some, masculine part in there like hey i'm i'm a real man i can do this job like a, a tough feeling of toughness in a way or maybe with colleagues yeah. or something 
Yeah, of course. I mean, the whole the whole kill floor, the, the whole meat industry in an abattoir is built on hierarchical, what they call hierarchical ego. So, on the kill floor, it's basically your gutters and your slaughtermen who are on A grade rates, so they rule the roost under your, on, over the top of your Bs, Cs, and D graders. And then it, it, that's how basically the order goes. The A graders have done all the jobs below to get to where they are. It's hierarchy. It's autocratic hierarchy, and they just bully the bully the shit out of each other. You know, see who's better than who. And, and, and it's generally the poor labour at the bottom who cops who cops it all from everybody else above him. Were you looking up in a way when you were starting? Yeah, what, yeah. Did, you wanted to achieve like a. Uh, that? I wanted to move up. I wanted to initially when I first got in the industry, I thought, okay, this is a career. I could go somewhere here. Uh, I wanted to to progress. Yeah, man. And and how can I see bullying um, in a in a slaughterhouse? What, what what's happening? Well, bullying to the workers, like for women, it's sexual harassment. They may get hit on day in day out by workers for phone numbers, particularly if they're they're, they're an attractive woman. Some men may get hit on, um, sexually harassed. Uh, there's other things like intimidation, uh, general workplace bullying, like pranks, uh, particularly entry level workers, they might get covered in blood. Just general workplace shit to test test them out, test the resilience. Yeah. Were there guys um, leaving the place because they couldn't handle it? Yeah, yeah, 50% of the, there was a 50% turnover, I've noticed, between three sheds. In, in what time frame? You put 20 workers on, within 12 months, you may have one left. Well, yeah. Wow. Brother, um, can you recall the moment when you, when you first, uh, what, what was your first um, A grade uh, job? Re remember that? Was it a bolt gun? Was it a, a knife work? What, what was it? My first agro job was a sticker. So basically, what is the sticker again? Skill. Stickers were a cut the throat and yeah. s a step of the windpipe after sh after the cow comes down from being stunned. Yeah. So stunned as in unconscious, unable to breathe, unable to have conscious, unable to regain conscious. The brain's been severed. And the sticker's role is is to cut any chance of. Uh, the cow coming back to the feet. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was my first A grade job. Yeah. So you you put the knife in the in the neck of the of the animal and you go from left so to right. We went basically. We went basically left. Or well, the way I was taught, I went left to right. Yeah. One motion, don't stop. One motion, straight across. Yeah. Make sure the windpipe severed, and sometimes if we had time, we. would Put a hook down and pull the pull the windpipe out, ready for the for the electrocutioner further down, who would give it an electric shock. Yeah, like six volts of electricity. Hmm. And and do you remember how you were feeling just a few seconds before you you went from left to right? It hit me. It hit me there once. My very first kill. Um, it was quite shocking because I'd never killed an animal like this before. I'd shot plenty of wild dogs and stuff like that on the farm, but I'd never commercially slaughtered an animal. Uh, yeah, it shocked me. It shocked me for a little bit. It took me a while to get used to the fact of killing an animal, actually killing an animal, being the component that actually is the dealer of death to an animal. Um, yeah. My very, my very first kill, um, I, I, I remember that day, actually. It was the day that I was supposed to be qualified or to be qualified, basically, on my job. So to get my certificate, I had to pass the test of doing the job pro properly. And it was my very first kill that I did by myself without any trainer or mentor or my buddy beside me. It was just basically a workplace trainer assessing me on my ability, as they call it, to do the job. So I remember stealing my knife, getting it ready, nice and honed and sharp. The cow dropped to the cradle. Cradle rolled her over. She was a beautiful 
black heifer, female cow. She looked in calf. Um, she lay on her back in the cradle like this with the, the front hocks up on the front feet. And a lifeless stare just stared at me. As I brought my knife over, I could feel her, I could feel a slight breathing on her nose. I grabbed her muzzle, put my hand over the top of her nose, and I put my knife down, and I could feel air in my, in my glove. I stopped for a few seconds, and I realized, well, it must be done. And then I could see her lifeless eye just staring in my face. And it's like, just end it, just finish it. It kind of burned into my head. She was an old dairy cow, I remember that. She looked so depleted. She was heavily in car. She was just rancid. And the look she gave me was just like, end my life, end it. So I, I did it. I put my knife to the left side of her throat. I pierced the skin and I just went one motion across quite deeply. Severed the windpipe, followed everything to the T within the book. And then that was that. She got shackled and then progressed further down the chain. And then there was a bit of celebration with me and my trainer and my buddies. We all kicked up a jeer um, that I successfully completed my very first kill by myself with no assistance. And it was like a, you know, you're a man now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you killed something. Almost as an initiation. It took uh, a while to think. It's like, wow, it's like I just killed a fucking animal. Yeah, and a big one. Like, uh, yeah. Cows are it quite... Took a uh, while to set in. It took a long time to set in. Then I realized that, well, I've just qualified for my trade now. I'm a slaughterman. I've done all the components and I've passed the critical point. Worked my ass off to get this far and I've done it. Mm -hmm. So then, and then you went home or did you go out with the boys? We went out after work with the boys and got blind over it. We celebrated. And then the next day, same thing. Same thing, back to work. And then by then I didn't need super, to be supervised. I then was competent and confident to do my job and I was signed off. So then I was a slaughterman in the mix. I was yeah. one of the boys. Yeah. Yeah, man. And then um, what, you did this for a couple of more years until you... I slaughtered actively for five years. Yeah. Oh, man. What is the... the I mean, it's it's horrific. Um, but in those five years, can you, can you highlight a few things? Slaughtering is a, is a process of its own amongst any role within an avatar environment or a slaughterhouse environment because... The slaughterman's role is literally to take the screams or the life from a cow, or in my case, a cow. Uh, can only speak with cattle here because I've only experienced with cattle. Uh, that was my role. It's probably the most toughest and the most hardest job to do physically and or more so mentally than physically because you, you're killing. You're killing X number per day. Um, I've done other jobs in the plant. I've worked in the offal room. I've worked in the gut floor. I've worked in the, what they call the fetal room. Fetal rooms and other worlds. Um, Why is that? Basically, half of the cows that come through a slaughterhouse are in calf. And then the unborn calves get taken out of their mothers as their mothers are processed through. Some are alive. So they're taken to the fetal room or they come through the fetal room. They're cut out of the placenta, measured up to specification, have their throats cut, hung up and have a little small tube inserted into the heart and then the blood pumped out. So basically unborn calves, to be polite, or fetus is the, is the correct term, and fetal blood is then extracted. Now that blood is what you call red gold sold for $1,000 per litre to the medical and the pharmaceutical corporations who then use it for blood transfusions and all the medicinal purposes that come with it. Wow. <clears throat> it's hard, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so... 
you you're doing this for for five years and and yeah i i hate the word uh highlights or things but what stood out for you like um in regards to to like what were the maybe the like, the most terrible moments if i can we call it that most terrible one of the most terrible moments is when a stun went horribly wrong there was only two times that that I've ever seen a stun go terribly wrong. I mean, there's been botch ups in procedure, what I've seen, but I've only ever seen a cow get back up after being stunned incorrectly twice off the cradle and then make a run for it down the kill field. Blood coming out of the head to just, just fear and adrenaline. Just nailed it up off the cradle, straight on the floor, nailed it straight down the, the, the what they call it, the, cha the channel from the knocking box to the kill floor itself. Uh, that was probably one of the most terrifying moments because you've got a, a cow that's out of control, running totally on fear. You don't know what it's going to do, whether it's going to drop dead, whether it's going to charge workers. You, you just don't know. Nobody knows. And it creates a bit of that panic in the area, so the workers become unsteady. Uh, they add a bit of fear to the cow. The cow becomes even more unstable. And then you've just got to wait for a supervisor to come along with a rifle and shoot the beast on sight. Hold it still, we'll get it to hold still and shoot it on sight. And then how many people are there on the killing floor? Kill floor teams, anywhere up to 20 people on a chain. Yeah. Quite a number. Yeah, it's a massive production line. Mm. Yeah. Great. Then you you climb up the ladder, and then you become the the trainer. Yeah, I I, I was chosen to become a protege workplace trainer. And and that in, involves no more killing. Well, I moved I, I moved out of the knocking or out of the slaughtering, and I moved more into a mental role because of my experience on a slaughterhouse as a general because I've done so many different jobs over my time, you know, from slaughtering. And then moving away or, or yeah. Uh, moving yeah. towards a mental role so yep. I'll start to train young workers coming through on different jobs. And what I was did it do to you? What did it do to me? Yeah, was it uh, like a relief or was it... Uh, it was a relief, yeah, to get off the floor to hang my knives up and become more of a leader, more of a mentor. I still seen killing going on, but I never did it myself. Mm -hmm. And how and long? By that you... stage in my career, I was well and truly desensitized and conditioned in my head that killing was okay. Yeah. 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 And, and the, what, if you can recall those, those moments, what, what were you, what was your, your, like your mission then you wanted to optimize the, 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 the progress, the process or um, like maximize. My, um, my, mission, my mission was, I was very, I was, I grew to be very detailed on procedure to getting it perfectly right. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, it was more to more so to relieve the suffering of the cows. I didn't want young workers. I didn't want to train workers to go through what I had to go through to make lots of mistakes until to get it right. I wanted them to learn pretty quick and get it right pretty quick. So we get a we get a cow in, we processed it, we just got it over and done with as quick as possible. Were these the first moments you were caring about the life of the animal or were you That's when were I started you... to realize. I started to realize at the tail end of my career that my head, I just physically and mentally had enough of the industry. Uh, I didn't want to be there. Uh, there was a better world on the outside. Is that what you were thinking, or is that what you were um, seeing as well, ex experiencing? I was seeing. I was seeing and experiencing. I late twenty twelve. I met a good friend of mine who got me into personal development and I started reading books, just reading books and associating with leaders of different business models. And I started getting around leaders and reading some books. Like what? What book? Can you... Think and Grow Rich is a classic book. Yeah. You read that three or four times and you, and you go back into a toxic environment 
of a kill floor or a burning room of, of a slaughterhouse. And it's like you're on a different planet. You cannot talk to those workers anymore. It's like, fuck, what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. feel I don't feel negative about my job. I feel negative just about being here because I'm on a higher level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. And then and then what? You read the books and then you, you didn't the feel comfortable. I made, I made a decision that I was physically and me, I just mentally had enough of the industry. Mentally Were you still uh, abusing substances? I was a heavy smoker and a heavy drinker, yes. I was off off the drugs, off the hard drugs, just smoking weed. Uh, but the decision came, yeah, man. I had enough of the industry. I was over it. Done. And then when did you pull the trigger? I started looking. I, my mentor encouraged me to get into more of a, a people role-based job. So I chose door-to-door -door selling. One extreme to the next, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I got into sales. Now, I never sold any freaking thing in my life, but I just made that decision to get into it, give it a go. So I went from a, a depressed meat worker into door-to-door -door selling, and I sold roofing for, um, for two years on after that, just to learn to talk to people. Yeah. What did you, we're not very sociable how, creatures, us meat workers. Yeah, I, I would just only want to ask, how were, how were your social skills? It took me three months to adjust to it. I was shocking. But you, somehow I got through it. I got through it. I, I, I was trainable. I was coachable. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I mean, uh, yeah. Wow. And, and um, you probably gave yourself permission to be coachable because I, I bet yes, not, yes. not everyone uh, is coachable. Um, um, so, because, yeah. Man. Because it was a full time income, it really, it really, came down to do or die yeah like i knew if i didn't if i didn't perform i wouldn't have a job the next day that's yeah. what it comes down to so i performed i learned all the skills that i needed and i did pretty well in that realm for a few years i got my confidence up to people i made a, some substantial money out of it and yeah. did all right i wouldn't say i was a successful businessman but i made a decent living out of it yeah and, and along those years, and also in the, in the slaughterhouse, were you um, living by yourself? Were you in a relationship with a family? I was in and out of relationships mm -hmm. um, from 2005, I think, four. Four when I got into the industry, yeah, four. Um, yeah, I was in and out of relationships. Um, and they always ended the same, yeah, viciously. Um, just unhappiness, sad. There was just something there in the void. Hmm. Um, yeah, man. And and um, and then you, you'd... I was never, I was never violent towards women. I was just, I was just toxic. Mm -hmm. In what in what way? I was just so negative. I was pessimistic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I guess we are, we all um, find find a way to um to release um yeah man mm. and and then i mean of course we can talk another hour about uh, relationships and, and and our position within the um um uh, yeah within a relationship uh, when we are exposed in 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 these circumstances um brother then you you do the sales jobs, then you do, um, and and I mean now, okay. now you 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 are uh, you are sharing your story, and and uh, I saw you on plant based meals, and 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 uh, I mean you, you and and you are sharing your story out in the open um, without holding back anything. Like what 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 can you tell me more about that shift? Like what happened there? You went from actually from a, I mean, it's tremendous growth. Yeah, it's been that. There's been a whole journey right there and then. When I left the meat industry, I never thought about getting any sort of psychotherapy or psychological help to help me delayer all the suppressed energy with my head. I mean, I've had a pretty messed up childhood as well, growing up with domestic violence and stuff like that. So all this trauma, plus my meat industry trauma, was suppressed. And men, us being men, 
we suppress everything too because that's how our dads condition us, right? Um, it's been a journey to get where I am as a compassionate warrior. So I got into the transport industry in 2014 is when I bought a courier business. I sold that in 2016 because I did really well, although it nearly cost me my mental and physical health. I sold that business and then I got into another career job. I stayed in the industry. 2017, I got into a relationship. And this is the pivot point of my crisis. Six months into, into that relationship, we had a massive breakdown. The relationship ended. I give full respect to this woman as she's a beautiful woman in her own right. Although she did trigger me. She did trigger a mental breakdown inside of me. I don't blame her. I don't share any anger with her. She's forgiven. Um, she triggered me to literally melt down. And all this negative suppressed energy come out. And then what actually happened was I ended up taking it out on, a, on, a, on an animal, a dog. I ended up killing a dog. With all, uh, in, in the intense, intensity of a breakdown, I killed a dog, which then I panicked after I did it. And then I tried to cover my tracks as we do. And then I got caught by the, by the welfare or the animal, what they call the RSPCA for doing it, which then spurred another seven months of going through the legal prosecutions of getting prosecuted and all the stuff with that. You know, basically as, me, as a man, I was, I was held accountable for my actions. So this relationship had triggered a breakdown, which, and then I did something to release that energy, which is a lot of suppressed energy there, which I didn't discover till later on after it was about September last year when I started getting proper therapy that it all related back to the meat industry, how I was conditioned to kill. That my brain was going, okay, I'm in an environment here where it's okay to kill. It's okay to kill something uh, for a commodity because the subconscious, you know, the subconscious doesn't, it has no feelings of good or bad, positive, negative. It just either acts or it doesn't. And so the way that I took my energy out was an indirect response to the way I responded in the meat industry that killing was okay. Unreal, right? And you can, you, yeah, you, so you get paid for killing cows. Yeah. Thousands a week. And I mean, of course, uh, it's also not good to kill a dog, but you get prosecuted for killing a, a dog. Yeah, I, it's 20th, 20th, 20th of September 2018, I got prosecuted and I pleaded guilty to three counts of animal cruelty. Um, I got put on two years probation and fined a lot of money. Basically, I was held for, I was held accountable for my actions. A uh, good magistrate at the time and he did what he was paid to do, which was to judge a person based upon their actions. Hmm. Uh, the 22nd of September 2018, I made a decision to, uh, to my exit strategy <clears throat> from the world. So a suicide attempt because I was having nightmares, heavy nightmares of screaming cows coming through the knocking box. It was just driving me crazy. Then the build up of my crisis that I'd just been through, I couldn't get that out of my head. And I thought, oh, fuck it. I'm not, I'm not wanted here. It's time to, to prepare my exit strategy. So I bought a 38 Smith and Western uh, pistol off a former meat worker friend of mine who's a renowned, he's a criminal these days, somewhere out there. And I traveled up to central Queensland, nine hours up, and I booked in a caravan and I planned to make an attempt on my life. So it was a Monday night on the 22nd. I loaded the pistol and I placed it to my forehead and I remember pulling the trigger twice and the gun jammed. Fully loaded fucking pistol jammed. Twice, it wouldn't fire. And then after the second attempt, my phone rang. And it happened to be a good friend of mine who is a vegan animal rights activist who actually gave a fuck because my name got plastered right through the media and I got totally shamed. And shame's a 
pretty toxic thing to a man in any case on any level. And he, he gave a fuck to actually sit me down with me on the phone and talk me through it on a 12 hour conversation and bring me forward out of that toxic way of thinking and come back home to seek the treatment that I needed to seek. Because I was in a pretty fucking dark state up here. Uh, I was just on one, one step mind that I wanted to, I wanted out, I wanted to leave the world. So a 12 hour conversation, over 64 pages of notes of just feeling, hatred, anger, envy, the works, just out of my head, burnt and destroyed. I come back down to Brisbane. I started seeking the treatment that I needed to have, psychological treatment, and then I reconnected with a man who is in, name's Alex, who is in the Mankind Project who invited me into the men's circles. And, and I attended my very first circle. And it was, it was a real confidence challenge. I had no confidence, I had no self-esteem, but I, I had the desire, desire. I needed someone, I needed a support group around me that went deeper than an AA circle or something. I needed somewhere where I could feel safe and speak my truth and not be fucking judged on it. And then I got hooked on these men's circles through the MKP and I just, I got that desire inside to keep going back, that hunger. You know, the hunger as uh, when we're little boys where we want to go back and, and uh, develop, you know, a little, little more as a man. We learn from men. Uh, I, 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 was in a, I was in a rough state. I needed a mentor. I needed a man to guide me through my darkness or help me guide myself through my own darkness and show me that feminine, that feminine love from a man for support and growth. And that's how I got through. And I worked, I worked through, I still do, I worked through with the men's circles, uh, which helped me heal from one side of my trauma and my psychologist it bounced through my psychologist to go deeper on the deeper layered trauma of where a clinical psychologist is specialized in. And as I got more into the men's circles, I finally did what they call a new warrior training weekend, June this year, where I went on a two and a half day weekend where I was initiated into the Mankind Project. So it's a rite of passage. This is, the, this is where the boy becomes a man on this weekend. Like you are fucking challenged. There is absolutely no hiding. It's an invite only. Um, they've sent men home on, on the initial stages of this because they, weren't, they, didn't, they didn't step up to become a man or play all out. I stepped up on that weekend. I went two and a half days. I did all the process work. I walked that mountain. First man, I'm the second man in the processes. I played all out. And then from that weekend, everything literally opened up. I went from my crisis stage to my opportunity stage, and then my story started to come together. It's like, fuck, what can I do here? I could build on this. I could literally build on this. I was already vegan. I went vegan back in September the year before. I threw out, I emptied my fridge because my AR friend helped me go transition to vegan. And the MKP sort of, it settled me. It grounded me. Yeah. Just for the guys uh, and girls, um, AR, animal rights activist, MKB, Mankind Project. Um, so, what, what, okay, you, you get a, um, um, you have an, an, uh, a vegan friend, um, but I mean, it still has, uh, is an internal decision. Like, what, what made you go vegan? For me to go vegan was more for the animals and more for the damage I'd done to a dog, to a puppy, and all for the damage I've done over the years through a career in killing. That's what, that's what essentially, um, we are back. Yeah, man. Are you okay for uh, another few minutes? Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. My Wi-Fi cut out. I think. Yeah, I lost. I lost connection. So yeah, that's man. Why I did. I yeah, cool. Take ownership of that technology. Yeah, um, man. <laughs> where was I? Yeah. Greg. I, yeah, I was just. Um, so you were mentioning um, you went. You went. You, you went vegan, and um, I was just 
wondering why why you you yeah you what, what vegan. drove me what, what drove me towards my path on on veganism and AR was because of all the years I spent with the damage I was doing unknowingly at the time that it was a job and it was because I had the crisis the actual mental breakdown that it was the bulk of that trauma predated back to the meat or the beef industry yeah and and how how does it a day look like for you now like what 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 do you do nowadays like i'm i'm, I'm a courier by trade I, that's my job um i do medical freight for the camp medical company which is it's challenging in its own sort of right but a typical day for me is going to work coming home and i'm slowly piecing my story together i'm writing a book with everything that i've gone through I'm actively seeing a psychologist still, um, which is going good as more of a check-in. Um, I'm putting together a corporate keynote or, or a speaking presentation because my absolute passion is to be on stage speaking. Uh, I love it. I love I love speaking. I've done it before. And I'll do it again and again. Uh, why? why do, what do you want to share? I want to share everything that I've been through because my mission in life is to create a world of transcendence through compassion. I want to transcend men's lives, send men into transcendence to come forward out of their darkness to seek, seek the assistance that they want or need, uh, but are too shameful. That wall of shame is there to ask for help. I want to break through that wall and say, Hey, I need help. I want help. I want this. What is what is much needed? You think uh, in order to do so for men? What what will be yeah. the yeah? So if you can give uh, like one one piece of it, uh, like a suggestion or advice for anyone listening or know of someone who um, who um, might need a bit of assistance or guidance. Ask, ask, ask for help. If you see the signs of self-encouraging to come out and talk, sit and talk, listen to their story, listen to their journey, just be there, just hold space for them, encourage them. Yeah, right on. Mm. And and then, so you're going to write a book? That is, I'm writing a but, book presently, so which is basically everything, my, my journey. Mm. Uh, circle you know the steps of redemption so basically where i've gone from my where i was born to my pre-crisis or so the build-up stage having the actual crisis and then and the fourth what they call the fourth quadrant or of all redemption so yeah. i've performed i've performed the ritual part of the death of the boy or a spastosis which was june this year where i walked the mountain and now I'm in that opportunity stage. It's like, okay, I'm writing. I'm putting everything together on tape. I'm starting to reach out and uh, do podcasts. I'm writing a book. I'm putting a speaking presentation together. Uh, putting a, a three-step formula together that basically what I've been through myself, which I will teach people to do so also to redeem their lives. That's because we we all we all mess up in life, but are we truly sorry for what we do? I think not. As men, we're not. We're not sorry for what we do. And redemption is all about redeeming our actions. We take it to a deeper level. Instead of that instant reaction when something happens, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We take it to another level. I'm going, okay, I own my shit, and I'm remorseful for what I've done. Beautiful man. Yeah, that's actually one of the one of the three principles that I'm putting together is own own my actions. Yeah. Oh boy, I've been been hiding behind the wall of excusing and blaming others for so long, and and only just now I'm I'm owning my shit and and mm -hmm. trying to take responsibility, and it's one hell of a ride, but it's so beautiful. Yeah. I, owning. Or owning my actions, as I put it, is owning everything I've done because we are held accountable, not by our thoughts, as what the, the business world and the personal development world say out there about ownership thinking. 
we are as men held accountable for our actions. The things we do is what we get held accountable for. The agreements we put into place, the agreements we have with other men, the actions that we act upon, whether they are right or wrong, we are held accountable for it. Magistrates are paid by the governments to hold people accountable for their actions. That's as simple as that. Uh, so where I come in, I go, well, own, own my actions. Own it. Yeah, I did it. Breathe into it. Feel that power. I did what I did. This is what I've done. This is what I've learned from it. And this is what I'm doing now to overcome it. And hey, whatever happened, happened. I did it. Yeah. No more numbing or suppressing. No, no more excuses of uh, playing victim or, or, or hiding. It's like, no, I did it. Yeah. No more. This goes beyond the yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Mm. It goes beyond. It goes beyond that mask that we put on that victim mask. Yeah. yeah. The second principle I teach is uh, plan or, or think in multiples. Or divergent thinking is the. Losing you again, bro. I think, I think it just reset itself, and I've put because I've got a my Zoom account across one account across multiple devices. Yeah. I was using my laptop, and now I'm on my phone. Yeah, good. So yeah, I hope so this video is coming through clearly. Yeah, man, it's all good. It's all clearly uh, for me. It, this re really works well because we're now um, um, centered next to each other again. Uh, so for okay. editing purposes, so this is uh, good. Um, yeah, man. Where were we? So um, I was up to principle two. So divergent thinking or thinking in multiples. That's the second principle that I teach. So mm -hmm. we've got one problem, one or one one error in my case of, okay, I've been charged with a criminal offence and shamed publicly. How, what do I do to overcome this? So I'm thinking one problem, multiple solutions, or one one and three by three. So one problem, three potential ideas. And then nine solutions. And why do I say nine? Because life's going to get in the way anyway. And we've got to have more than one sort of plan in order to get through the road or, or plan the route because things happen. It's a psychological term, man. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Multiples. And the third step I teach is serve, serve my cause or serve, serve my demons. So in my case, because it's a mixture of mental health and animal rights, it's I get out there and I I do at, outreach work with Anonymous or an AV. I volunteer myself through different organisations. I'm very active in the mental health space as well. Um, I'm out there talking to men uh, about mental health. It's just serving my demons. And this is where the... The or this is where we fuse the AR sector with the animal rights with the mental health to become the compassionate warrior. It's like I'm acknowledging multiple elements. So there's three types of warriors out there. There's the warrior who lives in shadow, known as the on mission, is in the shadow mission. Who's the average man? Who's just you know? There's every domestic violence shelter out there who's full of a man who's on mission in shadow. Um, there's Foster homes are full of kids because of men who are living in shadow. There's just heaps of stuff going on in the world because men don't know how to be men and they're living in shadow. And the second type of warrior is a light warrior. Again, we see these light warriors everywhere. Uh, they're so focused on their one cause. I mean, I went from a shadow warrior to a light warrior initially with the animal rights. I was so focused on animal rights that. I was forgetting my mental health element as well and not realizing the damage I was starting to do or, or become because I was so focused on just save the animals, just, just be there for the animals and that's that. So that's where the light warrior, they misunderstand. They're so focused on that one cause. They don't understand their damage, what they do around. I see it in the AR sector pretty well. I see it. Extinction Rebellion is a classic example of where light warriors hang about and the mental health space. Uh, advocates are for, you know, PTSD, depression, anxiety are so focused on on their, their movements, but yet they're not open to talking about 
let's say, switching to to a more vegan friendly diet that's more friendly for the animals in turn, which will come back as the law of attraction to be more friendly on patients' minds, hearts and souls with what they ingest. And the third type of warrior is one, it's the new warrior that we're taught in the, in the Mankind Project and I've recalled it compassionate. It's where we take all the elements of all movements and combine it to one. Because as traditional tribal men, we are taught energetically to love our Mother Earth as she provides for us all the resources to survive, thrive and live. And we respect, we respect Father Sky as Father Sky guides us as tribal men as, and our communities with energy to wherever we may roam on, on Earth. And the energy protects us from bad weather. It, it guides us towards the good food, good resources in order for us to live. And then we also love Mother Earth's animals and walk with them on their journeys as well. We respect all life and all sentinel beings. That's where the heart of the compassionate warrior is. We embrace it all. We just don't pick and choose. Aho. Third principle, aho. We serve our cause. That's so beautiful, Greg. Um, I would love to have you here again and 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 uh, go into some some details on some other topics. Um, it's one thing I would like to um, highlight. <clears throat> There was uh, like way back when you were mentioning um, about suppression and how that comes through our father line. Uh, are you open for for sharing a bit more on on how you see yeah. things now from from your perspective and father and and maybe granddad and and, and so like suppress suppression suppression is when we suppress trauma we layer trauma so depression itself in its own element is layered trauma like an onion you peel a layer off an onion deep traumatic or clinical psychology de layers each session is another layer coming off particularly the deep trauma, so sexual trauma, um, domestic violence, you know, ingrained, all that deep stuff. Uh, so it's like de-layering an onion to de-layer all these layers of trauma. Where the heritage comes from, from father to son. A father teaches his son what that father was taught by grandfather and so forth. In my case, my father taught me the same way granddad taught him to run the farm or own, you know, walk, you know, run a farm. But basically it was the 1990s and not the depression era. So I was being taught depression era survival tactics in the 1990s from the 1930s and 40s to survive. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting how this all is connected. And yeah, I... I was, literally of... taught, I was literally taught to leave school early and follow dad around the farm because that's how dad done it. Yep. Yeah, man, it's like a, this, this domino game with all these pieces. And it's yeah. what I see now is correct. Just saying stop right here, right now, and let's do things slightly different. Yeah. Where, where, I, where I am now with my father, the farm is gone. It's been sold. My father's 80 years old in a nursing home and I go and see him every second Saturday and spend time with him. And we are connecting now on another level. So forgiveness is all and healing is happening and we are connecting because there is no farm there anymore. He can't teach me anything anymore. It's just me and him connecting on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's beautiful, man. Beautiful. It's magical. He's in the next phase, you know, in the next transition of his life. So I'm there spending as much time as I physically can with him. And how does that make you feel? Makes me feel happy inside. That there's one, one element of my life, one crucial element of my life that's finally healing. Healing to a degree, something that I've wanted for a number of years. And that's time with my dad father and son time yeah and what is is there something you want to say to 
to other men who are listening now about father son and 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 the importance of i mean you're now addressing how important this is for you like uh i i have friends or family members and they don't they don't want to see father like uh, would you encourage uh to 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 reconnect i would encourage i would encourage for forgiveness to to come inside to reconnect um, as sons we need our fathers in our life not as teachers just dad just being dad yeah just time with dad father and son time yeah. not doing anything just spending time in each other's presence and just talking connecting have a talking yeah. stick if things aren't going so well sit down and do it respectively one-on-one with a talking stick sort your differences out yeah yeah beautiful sure sure is yeah greg thank you i I, I mean i think we are already an hour and uh, and a half in um i I just want to save something for for a possible next episode um yeah man i've got i've got a uh, a question i, I want to ask you if you have a question for our um for our next um our, our next um person in the show i want to introduce this so I mean uh, I don't know yet who's going to be next, but I thought it would be a cool idea to, um, yeah, to like you can ask anything, and then the next person will um, will answer the question. So what is it that you want to ask the next guest, if anything? What's I challenge the next man is what's something deep down I don't know about you. What is something deep down? You don't know about I don't know about you. Yeah. Cool. That's a beautiful one. Thank you. Before I wrap up, any other words of wisdom you wanna you wanna get off your chest now? We can work with, I mean, can we uh, of course when you, the book is there, uh, I will promote it, but is there anything anywhere? Can we follow you on Instagram or something? You can follow me on Instagram, Craig Whitney Transforms. For now, I'll have my Facebook up and going in the next week and a bit where I'll be crossing over with Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Um, I'll have all my, I'm getting all my logo and branding done. So I am commercializing a lot of my stuff because I do want to take this to the world and make a career out of it. Yeah. So, cool. So right now, the most, um, the best place Mostly, is Instagram. The best place is Craig Whitney Transforms on Instagram. And that's where I've shared a lot of my posts. I've dug deep within my trauma where I've delayed my stuff and I've gone all out. Yeah. And I can totally uh, um, acknowledge our beautiful brother for that. Um, I'm following him and I encourage you to follow him as well on the gram at Craig Whitney transforms it's been an absolute pleasure man thank you so much for not holding back and sharing everything with us tonight welcome